Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the second conference call of the year. A lot has happened since we last met, so we've got a lot to update everyone on. Enzo, I see you're here. Um, William as well. If uh, Enzo, would you like to give a, a brief update on some of the things that have uh, been happening since we last all met? Thank you, Ryan, for your introduction. I just want to say that uh, we are at a good point because um, we are still waiting uh, the approval for the Ministry of Health for uh, um, the next uh, uh, step of animal uh, um, on test on animals. Uh, but uh, we are moving forward anyway because we know that the Ethical Committee for uh, protection of animals accepted our request so we've been approved uh, and now we are waiting for the authorization of the ministry uh, we did uh, the first um, set of experiments on a cadaver which is something uh, let me let me be proud about it you know we are not uh, as you know most of us uh, you know at least the founders and uh, you know we are not scientists but according to the law we should do, be do only, um, you know, test on rats and then animals and then move um, directly on a human trial. But we decided to work before uh, uh, to arrive to a human trial on a cadaver because you want to try the surgery on a cadaver just because uh, we are very scrupulous and we want to do things uh, very, very well, very precise. So. We did the first thing and uh, we are, uh, I would say, satisfied for what we did so far because we are trying uh, different options of the surgical technique coordinated by our main plastic surgeon, Tor Michele Riccio, and uh, things are, are, are going well. So we are just waiting to receive authorization for the same lab where we do cadavers lab to start the second step of experiment on cadavers. It will happen in these days, for sure, uh, in, you know, within the end of September. And then, uh, you know, we, we can move forward with the animal trials when we will receive authorizations from the ministry. Yeah, great. Thank you, Enzo. So, yes, yeah, so that's the status of our, basically, where the sheep trials are at right now. For those of you who have been following our newsletters over the months, there's a few other things we'd like to update you on. One of them being the the uh, histologic study. You know that we have an ongoing um, histology study with histologics. There were some issues uh, with sourcing donor tissue for that study in the past. Uh, however, histologics found a new source and they are currently working through some of the administrative processes to get approval on the donor's end um, so that they can start opening up that pipeline to get tissue flowing over to histologics and then they will conduct their the final the remaining portion of their histology study and after that we'll be able to publish the results and uh, they will provide us with detailed images and William can fill you in more about what that will entail but then we can pass those along to you and um, you know add to the to the body of scientific knowledge out there on the anatomy of the foreskin so that we can have a greater in-depth understanding of of the value of it and you know why it is that we are working to regenerate it <clears throat> for those who have been uh, circumcised and are not happy with that um also as you know uh dr rossi in italy has also uh been contracted we've also contracted with him for uh producing a histology study that's different in scope from the one that's being done by histologics and the source of tissue for the, the new source of tissue that histologics has found uh, should be able to provide tissue for Dr. Rossi as well. So we should be able to move forward on both of those in the near future. William, did he, did you have something to add to that? I think it's kind of important to take a to take a few steps back from from everything that's going on and just look at the the big picture. One of the big things is that we have several different projects going on. We have the two histology projects. We have the cadaver lab. We have the animal trial and we also have the tissue sourcing. So the tissue sourcing was one of the biggest issues for several reasons. 
one, we're very specific on how we're getting our samples. We're not taking it from people that were uh, circumcised against their will, uh, under erroneous medical practices, anything like that. So that immediately rules out most of the sources that we could have used. Our original source, when all of this was put together, when these histology studies were put together, and when we were in the previous animal trial, was actually, there was, uh, I believe part of the sourcing came through Ukraine, which is one of the reasons why everything was held up for so long. Um, and with COVID, that also made it just uh, areas or um, suppliers, tissue suppliers, that previously would help us with sourcing, uh, were no longer allowed to because of tighter international regulations on transferring tissues. So unfortunately that kind of put a hamper on things, but, um, so if you take a, st a few steps back and look at the, all those different projects going on, like why, what, where, and when, obviously the whole goal of all this stuff is to get to human clinical trials and prove that what we're trying to do will work and we can make it a mainstream procedure. So one step back from that is the cadaver labs and the animal trials. And those are kind of going on simultaneously, which is really cool for us because we don't have to do the animal trial and then wait another year to get the two human clinical trials uh, through the, uh, finish the animal trial, then go to human clinical trial. We're actually doing uh, the cadaver lab and then the next animal lab uh, is going to be starting up. And one of the important parts about that is this gives the surgeons, uh, and it's not just a surgeon, it's a team of uh, skilled people. It's a surgeon, a urologist, uh, an anatomist. These people are all collaborating and working together and we're actually actively seeking other surgeons as consultants and I, I really like the hit by the bus mentality uh if like the surgeon dropped dead from a heart attack tomorrow that would be pretty horrible but also important for the organization you would have a sudden lack of surgical coverage so having other people in the loop or ready to go if needed is always a, a we think a really strong contingency plan so we have a surgeon that's working on in the cadaver lab on the surgical technique with these, this group of people, with the urologist, the anatomist, and they're all working together on what the best method is going to be. And it seems like it's going pretty slow. Like we just saw some of the research from the first cadaver lab. And I know several of you have asked questions about nerve endings, stuff like that. And they are aware of some of these questions. And I'm going to reiterate with them when we probably around the time we get into the second cadaver lab. Uh, when I hope they'll have more time to really step back with me and, and discuss some of these questions that you guys have voiced up. But um, the cadaver labs are a really big, important part to practice and make sure the surgery uh, is a functional surgery the way we intended it to be. And then to use those surgical techniques in the animal lab as well to, to actually help us get to clinical trials. And then if you take a few steps back from that, we have the histology studies going on. And the histology studies aren't just something that's publishable for us. Like even if for some reason we couldn't publish it, the information we're going to get from that is going to help us better understand the different cellular uh, motifs, the different cellular structures and what they should look like. You know, we can do all the things in the world to regenerate, but if it's not as identical to the original as possible, then we're really not doing our job. So that's kind of a reality check for us on the recellularization side. Um, and there will be more, uh, more research for that uh, after the histology study. Um, but th that's kind of like a big scope, uh, taking a few steps back from several points. You have the histology, you have the animal trials and the cadaver lab, and then ultimately the human clinical trials. So, um, Rod, do you have anything to add to that or any more points to throw in? Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for going in depth there and catching us up. And I was going to say, maybe I'm jumping around a little bit, but you touched upon nerve endings, which innervation is something that gets asked about a lot. And I wanted to pass the ball back over to Enzo because I think, you know, Enzo, you have some information to share about your looking into um, specialized nerve structures such as Meisner's corpuscles and the work that you've done to bring on new um, expertise to help us tackle that issue. Yeah, I, I found these uh, important publications online about the nerve endings of the foreskin, and I found out they're all made by the same person. So what I did, I contacted this guy, and it was very, very nice guy. He answered, um, you know, immediately, almost immediately. 
I like after a couple of hours, and then we started to to talk. Uh, also, we exchange our phone number, so I can call him anytime. He lives in Spain, and basically, he's um, uh, he studied the nerve endings of the foreskin for the last forty five years, so he knows everything. And um, I like to think about our project that is. Um, a pioneering uh, uh, biotechnology project, but uh, also traditional surgery in a certain way. In a certain way, so we can uh, link the two the two way of thinking, uh, the traditional surgery. So the surgery, you know, has, has made traditionally always in the same way in uh, on the human body. Yeah, we need uh, obviously, you know, surgeons, uh, specialized plastic surgeons, but also with this uh, pioneer pioneeristic ideas we have, and uh, you know, I like to um, to think that uh, we can do both. So to talk about this doctor, Doctor uh, Jose Antonio Vega, he uh, explained to me that it's not. Um, difficult to to re, uh, re innervate basically the forest and obviously it's not easy but uh with dottoressa bondioli we are thinking how to uh, get over the obstacles so uh, we are going to use the same at uh, the right time during the surgery growth factors and specific stem cells that will um, allow uh, the, the regeneration so in addition to the a stitch and to the traditional surgery in which uh, we will transplant the foreskin we are going to add this uh, uh, novel um, technology with stem cells and with the knowledge of dr vega about the nerve ending so i'm very satisfied and i'm very optimistic about the result yeah i am too and i think maybe um maybe we could talk a little bit about you know we've talked about where where we've been the past six months now we can talk a little bit about where we are now and what we are hoping to achieve in the near future, in the short term, long term. You know, after the first round in the cadaver lab, Dr. Riccio um, made a lot of important discoveries, learned a lot of important information and gave a presentation to the board. And it's helped to inform, give us more options in terms of what the final procedure that we use in human clinical trials will look like. And so at this point, we are, the team is assessing that and looking, looking at what we need to do in the next round of sheep trials in order, to, in order to prepare ourselves to hopefully meet our goal of getting ourselves in the position to begin human clinical trials in late 2024. William or Enzo, do you have anything to add to that in terms of where we are at now and what we're looking to do in, in the near future? I, I can add in there that the next round of Cadaver Lab I know one of the big points is to definitely try honing down the surgical technique. And uh, additionally, there was, I think it was Dr. Riccio and a few of his colleagues were interested in making sure their microsurgical techniques are essentially planned out correctly. There was a lot of talk about where they would split into uh, arteries or how they would get uh, innervation. So I know a big portion of the next uh, cadaver lab is going to be them uh, investigating into that side of things. Obviously, I haven't gotten a report for the next cadaver lab yet or a, um, uh, itinerary or plan yet. So I'm, I'm, we're really eager to see what their exact plans are for the next cadaver lab. So it's, it's moving along. And as far as the animal trials, I, I think we kind of like, uh, talked about that where we're, we're in the paperwork process. Unfortunately, we got the animal, uh, I forget what, which committee approved and which committee we're waiting on, but. That's unfortunately the case with systems like this, not just in Italy, but in the US, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of different hoops to jump through. Very similar for a human clinical trial. And uh, that was actually something that we talked with with the surgeon is uh, approval for surgical techniques. So that's another piece of the cadaver lab that's going to help us if we can get a jump start on the paperwork for the surgical technique approval so that we can start the human clinical trial when we plan to. We're uh, actively talking with the surgeon about that and then when that can be done at what point do we need another cadaver lab or do we need uh after the next cadaver lab can we start that paperwork uh that kind of stuff so there's a lot of logistics that are going on right now super boring part that no one wants to hear about um, <laughs> there's a lot of logistics surrounding 
how to get to where we want to be. So Animal Lab, you need to have all these approvals from different committees. So we have the samples and everything ready to go. That's that's not an issue for the Animal Lab. For the Cadaver Lab, I believe it's scheduling the next time slot so that we can have the relevant people present and then be able to get on site. And then for the human clinical trial, to, to prep the procedure for the human clinical trial, there's a whole lot of logistics that go into which department, which governmental departments need to be notified or seek approval from. So the, those are the next immediate steps. And then I guess the next future steps after uh, the next cadaver lab and after the after the um, animal trial start, the surgeon that's in the cadaver lab will be heavily involved with the, with the animal trial, uh, essentially ensuring that his procedure and relevant innervation techniques are working in the animal models. So uh, and Enzo, I'll op open that for you for any additional comments. Yeah, I just still want to say, like you said, that there are, um, you know, we, let me, let me talk, uh, let me say this clearly. We have a clear idea on how to move uh, surgically. You know, the first uh, results from the cadaver's lab uh, are telling us that we are going in the right direction. So it's good. But, uh, you know, despite that, we want to add more professionals, more doctors. And um, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, this is a mix between traditional technique and new techniques. So this is something you can even help us uh, in case, uh, you know, there is some scientist uh, between uh, among you guys. You maybe you can find some uh, specific publication in some part of the world that uh, has um, the goal to reattach uh, the extracellular matrix on the body in, uh, let's say, not in the flat way, like uh, if you put flat the skin on a structure, which is the arm of the leg, but only in a tubular way, like it is the first. So this is, could be some new, because we are always looking for uh, uh, creativity, uh, you know, about uh, uh, new, new ways to make the surgery. So we already have a good idea and it's going very well, but uh, uh, we want to add more professionals. And uh, actually I am the guy who is uh, recruiting the new, the new scientists because uh, it's going to be a multidisciplinary a surgery, you know, even in the surgery room. So we want uh, we want a lot of people. We want more people for sure. And uh, yeah, uh, you spoke also about the delays, which are normal. Um, so we had delays because there was August in which everybody is on vacation. We had delays because uh, the entity that supervises and protects the animals. Uh, uh, you know, took too much time to answer and uh, finally we got its authorization and without this authorization we couldn't uh, have the authorization of the Ministry of Health to move forward for the trial. So now we have, we are waiting for this authorization and even uh, like you said for the human trial it's going to be, uh, we, we have to make uh, different requests and it's going to take time to have uh, um, you know, the reply and the approval. Um, I know that uh, since now Dr. Essa Bondioli is working with the, the ethical committee, uh, you know, of the clinical trial, consider that we are doing something uh, a little bit, um, how can I say, um, we need to uh, convince people of the ethical committee uh, that it's something that it's really useful what we, we, we are doing. And uh, this is something, uh, you know, our scientists, especially Dr. Serena Bondioli, is taking care with the ethical committee of the ministry. But think, uh, things, are, you know, I, I would say that are going very well for where we are and for what we did. So let's see. <laughs> Yeah, great. Awesome. So on that positive note, I think now is probably a good time to turn the microphone over to you. If anyone out there in the audience has a question or a comment for us, go ahead and just, I uh, believe you should have a button to raise your hand. So go ahead and do that if you have a question. There we go. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, this was more about how are you going to ensure the elasticity of the foreskin once it is installed surgically? How are you going to ensure it is able to, you know, compact or stretch 
basically expansion and contraction of the foreskin when the person is erect or not, or otherwise? So, or is this something that you're thinking through as you go through the surgical procedure, that maybe there are actions for the patient to do after the surgery? Like some stretching to kind of ensure that this works? And if it doesn't work the way it should, is there going to be a second surgery that the patient would have to do? Because every patient's cases could be different. Like some people have some part of frenulum left. Some people don't even have any frenulum to begin with. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can answer at the beginning and then you continue, William, if you don't mind. Uh, we already okay. did some tests uh, with the elasticity of the tissue at the University of Bologna. And uh, uh, the tissue was uh, uh, responding very well. According, uh, obviously, we have to fit this tissue to each specific patient. So... Basically, the problem you are uh, you are talking about is uh, shape and size, shape and size of the foreskin, which is important, and then how to adapt on the you know on, on each patient. Obviously, we don't want to, to do a second surgery, and uh, but we must be obviously careful to avoid any possible phimosis, which is something that happens naturally to a penis. And uh, so we must be very careful. Go ahead, uh, uh, William. Yeah, thank you, Enzo. And to answer your question about like a multi-part procedure, absolutely, that would be a conversation that you have with the doctor before going in so that you understand what the outlook looks like and how many, if there needs to be more than two procedures. Uh, right now, I, I believe we're envisioning a two-part process with the surgical aspect being really on the second uh, surgery. To answer your question, if like a frenuloplasty or if uh, an additional surgery is needed, that may be the case for some people, but that would also be something that in the consultation with the doctor, when you first, when you first meet up and discuss, you know, what your expectations are and the surgeon speaks with you, that would be where you discuss how many surgeries it would probably take and what the outcome would look like. And uh, to kind of answer one of the topics that Enzo brought up is the shape and size of each foreskin and the shape and size of every patient is going to be different. That's part of what we hope our limb system will help us with. We actually, uh, Ryan and I are actually going to be playing with the limb system, just preliminary poking around it. Ideally with the limb system, a donor sample comes in, it's cataloged and marked and uh, a patient is a waiting sample and you will match in that system, the patient and the donor sample. And the surgeon obviously will look over the two and in the consultation, make sure that that is suitable for your need. So those pieces are there. I hope that answers your question thoroughly. Hi, good to be here. Thanks for putting on this call. By the way, I really appreciate these. So I actually have a buddy that I keep in touch with who is also a monthly donor to Forgan. And me and him are actually both restoring. We kind of bounce ideas back and forth from each other as to how to best restore in the meantime. I'm pretty sure I've asked this question before, and probably other people have as well. But it keeps asking me, like, hey, how are you sure that Forgan's procedure will work if we're already restored? And I keep saying, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. All you'd have to do is remove the restored one and replace it with a regenerated one. I'm just asking, you know, am I crazy here? Is there any reason why the procedure would not work on a restored man? Oh, I think that uh, there are good possibilities that it works. So I, like you say, you know, why it shouldn't work? You know, we are not, uh, we have more skin and uh, should be for sure easier to transplant the foreskin inside this uh, extra tissue that you have already restored. This is my personal opinion. Okay, so you guys see no reason as to why it wouldn't work, right? Yeah, so I, I was going to say, um, based on the information we currently have and everything, they're, they're, keep doing what you're doing. There's, I, I don't see any reason, surgically, why you wouldn't be able to continue. As Enzo said, the technique we're looking at now, it looks like, essentially what Enzo said, like there, there, there's no reason to be removing that skin that you've regenerated. We could use that for the procedure um, to help. Would you guys most likely just be removing the restored skin and replacing it with the regenerated one? I don't think so. I think it would be uh, attached to the restored skin. That's actually something we could directly talk to the surgeons about, um, as especially as we go into round two of the uh, cadaver phase. And do you, 
more to add to that or yeah let's say you know when somebody was asking me this question uh, in, in the past i wasn't to uh, you know i'm always the president of a company here so i'm always uh, and also i have a different mentality and i uh, i don't want to say something in the, and then then uh, can give uh, bad suggestions to people or disappointments. We didn't have, uh, uh, we didn't know enough about this forest skin restoration. We know that it shouldn't, it shouldn't jeopardize the regeneration. And we we know also. I've spoken with uh, some scientists that uh, they tell uh, that it shouldn't be a problem. This is uh, the answer that I feel. Uh, to tell you now how to you know to because uh, uh you know it's uh, extra tissue that to, we are going to utilize anyway okay because my goal is to be like a ci9 meaning full erect coverage i heard somebody say that the regenerated skin would be attached i mean that would be like at least in my case too long you know what i mean so that's where my concern is I would almost rather just have the skin removed and fully replaced with a fully regenerated one. Or am I misinterpreting your answer? No, I, I understand what you're saying now. Um, again, that would be a consultation with the surgeon. You, you would say like, this is what I want. And they could say, cool, these are the options we could do. Like we could remove or we could, they might be able to pull skin back or surgically graft on the inside because you're still going to be missing your friend, frenulum and the uh, different structures of the foreskin with the re restoration stretching. So it, just those portions, if you want, like that would be a con uh, conversation with the surgeon himself to make sure that your expected outcome is understood and that he, uh, he or she is able to do that with the materials. And that might be where they use a smaller foreskin for your case, donor foreskin, I mean. Does that make sense? Not really, because the restoration, you know, it restores a lot, but it's a big difference from having the fully regenerated thing. Like, I'm just asking, would they be able to replace the restored skin with a regenerated one? Like a fully regenerated foreskin? Yes, the restoration should not hinder uh, a regeneration. The, at the, the end point, you would be talking with the surgeon and you say, like, I want full coverage at, um, at full, uh, full engorgement, full erection. They would be able to use that information and say, okay, for a full reconstructed uh, foreskin, X, Y, and Z. Hello everyone. My question is more for the future and it's the question that is mostly circulating in my head. So let's say everything goes well for the human trial and it's successful in everything. And let's say, you know, there is a public procedure in, I don't know, maybe 2027, maybe 2028. You have said in the past that you are committed to treating the supporters first, the four again supporters. I don't know how many supporters there are since the beginning of Forgan. Maybe 20,000, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. Are you confident that you can serve all these, all these supporters within, let's say, five years after the procedure is public? And obviously, this has a direct relation with having enough surgeons and donor tissue. So maybe you could answer that for me. Thanks. Well, we are um, facing all the problems that, uh, you know, everybody that works with organ transplantation works. So the shortage of organs. Uh, if somebody has a problem to the heart, uh, it's not easy to find the right heart. It's not easy to find uh, the tissue, but we can find it. So I think that we, we have the same problems that all the others have with the organ transplantations. So it sounds like your question is about scaling, meeting the challenges of scale. William, um, did, did you have some thoughts on that, on, on some potential strategies we, we may pursue? The, the idea of like the five-year plan, I do feel that like a number similar to what you gave us, like around that area. Right now, we, we may be able to accommodate that, but there's no telling in like a year or two if those the donor samples will be there or if, you know, there's going to be COVID around 25, whatever it wants to be. There, there's three critical factors here. Travel, you have to get to the surgeon in Italy. Donors, we need to supply. We need to have the samples to use for the final patients. And then we need to um, facilities. With those three variables in mind, like right now, it, it does look like we, we could accomplish that five years, maybe a little bit longer than that, but also like with the single surgeon and with the, um, we're trying to bring on more surgeons, stuff like that. So that's the facility side is 
slowly being answered with bringing on more surgeons and uh, ac acquiring relevant talent, right? Um, the travel side, we really have no control over. So unfortunately, uh, if like there's a huge travel ban, uh, you know, Italy's on the watch list now, we, we would have to figure out how we're going to bring the procedure closer to the U.S. or to other countries so that it's available. But that's uh, obviously that's something we're really concerned with right now. We're trying to get to the human clinical trial, get through that. Uh, and then if we have more surgeons, that also gives us the ability to, if, if they can spread out or desire to. The third one with the samples and the, the donor side. So that's one that we actively have been talking about. And one of the big things with that is after we get through human clinical trials, right? We, we're not done. We, we have a lot of work to do still. And one of the big, uh, the big pushes that we've been talking about, and after we get through the human clinical trial, it's an approved procedure, the procedure can carry on. Uh, the certain, you know, now the surgeon can accept people, you know, from the, from the donors side to come, um, from you, you guys, like from the donors for fortune, I mean, uh, to be patients for the procedure, it's been approved. One of the big things for us is looking at ECM production sourcing and also potentially working with bioreactors to regenerate, uh, regenerate the material that's needed on a larger scale. So we have to get to that point first. And then we can, uh, and again, once that point is, is set, that the human clinical trial, once we get through the human clinical trial, we do have the support to carry on from there, but obviously to help larger numbers and to mass go into like mass production. I hate saying that it's not really mass production, but to go into uh, a mass care, uh, type, um, endeavor, we, there's going to be more research needed. So, um, that answer your question more thoroughly? Yes, it does. I mean, obviously the organization is interested in serving way more people than Foregan's supporter base. But I was wondering, you know, about the supporters for us, everyone in this conference. I think every single one of us is interested for themselves, for the surgery, you know? I can understand that there might be scaling problems in the future. I'm not too sure how it will work, even for the few thousands, maybe 20,000 supporters. I don't know. That's why I'm asking, but thank you for your answer. Yeah, no, for the, for the 20,000, for that part of the answer, I like you said, like a five year plan, I think it would be more realistic, a 10 year plan, something like that. But again, that's like right now with the samples and with the logistics that we, we have under our belt now that may change. in you know, we, if we lose this, uh, sample, uh, a donor, uh, pipeline. That could change um, if a if a rule. So that that's just one of the the hurdles, one of the logistic hurdles that happened, right? That happened with our with our uh, one pipeline for samples, and that set us back. Uh, I want to say almost set us back two years, um, along with other variables, of course. But that like it, it's um it's a hard answer to to give a solid number on. Um, I I think the like a 10 year timeline for roughly that amount of people is a realistic, uh, especially when we have the more surgeons. Uh, I think that's a realistic number that we could chew on and then projecting on beyond that, we would definitely be doing research into the ECM production, stuff like that. So that we could, we could serve people faster. So like, let's say five years in, we have something in place, we could serve people faster. So there's more research needed as well after the human clinical trial, but once that's vetted, we, we definitely have, we're in a setup, uh, that we, we can help the people like on this call that have been donating and supporting us from the get go. So, so you were saying 10 years from, from public release. Yeah. Ju just as like a rough estimation. Yes. Yeah. For that amount yes. of people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. If I can add something to this uh, discussion, consider that uh, we want to finish the part of the human trial now. But uh, when we finish and we analyze the data, you know, we want to create uh, another project, a second project to serve, uh, you know, the thousand, the hundred thousand of people that want their forest kid back. Obviously, you know, it's going to be crucial to know, to demonstrate to our future donors or um, funders uh, that uh, the first human trial uh, is okay. Uh, so it's also a question of how much money we will have when we will decide to move forward. Um, everything, uh, you know, costs, as you know. 
so the research is very expensive we are uh, we've so far we have been very good to you know to work with not much money but if we want to give uh, uh, 100,000 um, foreskins to 100,000 donors so 1 million of foreskins to 1 million no, it's going to be a completely different and much more expensive project in which uh, you know we need to convince uh, uh, funders uh, people who want to invest and um, so consider also this factor yeah and I'll just add on to that that Sort of adding on to what William and Enzo said, human clinical trials really is what we're focused in, focused on right now. I know in the past, things like 3D bioprinting have been mentioned. Other forms of tissue have been mentioned. ECM production has been mentioned. These are things we're all very well aware of. It's just that uh, it's something that'll take our main focus later on in the process, probably during or most definitely after human clinical trials. So we don't really have a concrete answer to give on that right now, but it is, it's a challenge that we're all very much aware of and anticipate, like Enzo just said, taking on a whole separate really operation when the time calls for it. So that's pretty much our answer now. Um, I have a question about like, Whenever the procedure becomes public, it's about pricing. I know your frequently asked question says around $10,000. Is that still accurate or will it be higher or lower? Do you guys have any more information about that? Well, uh, um, we can't give you a specific answer to this now because um, uh, if I consider how much more money we spend on the cellularized forest, which is... Uh, a rough cost, uh, you know, a raw cost for uh, the surgery, and then the the work of the surgeon, and then uh, you know there are other things. So I'm not able to tell you how much it will be. Maybe it's even less of ten thousand, but uh, uh, who knows? I can add to that. I think uh, the crux of what Enzo is trying to say too is we're not into the second round of cadaver lab yet. And there were some changes made to the original idea for the surgery by the surgeon. So I think it's going to be, well, as we're getting into the animal trial, uh, and the surgeries set, and that's what we're going to be performing on the animals. That's when we'll have an idea of how much it should cost right now. Things may change a little bit. He's got to test them, uh, different aspects of the microsurgery side out. So we don't, we don't have a solid answer on that until we, until the procedure is vetted and we have a solid idea of what the procedure is going to be. And then as Enzo said, the ECM, that's something uh, like a, a separate part of it that goes into the final cost that we'll have to figure out as well. But we will update that on the website once we have a solid, a solid uh, cost assessment. Yeah. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. You guys are all awesome as well. Anyone else got a question? So I know you said you're focused on getting to the human clinical trial right now, but I think we're still technically in animal trials. Is that right? We've still got one more round to go, correct? Yes. Okay. When is that expected to start? The final round of animal trials. I forget the exact date on that. The, the sheep trials will, will be finished within the end of this year. So the human trial, uh, we in our plan, we want to do after the summer of next year. Yeah, so, the sheep trials, we've been planning to start them this month, but as, as we mentioned earlier in the conference call, there's just it's just been a little bit delayed in terms of getting ethics approval. Um, we've been getting approval from a variety of different committees, but we're, I, I believe there's just one more we're waiting for. And so we hope to get it this month. So we're, we're thinking the sheep trials might, hopefully they'll begin late this month, but probably more like October. So again, it's it's um, delays that are outside of our control. We've done everything that we've needed to do on time. We've just uh, gotten a little bit delayed on the um, ethics approval. So I think to answer your questions, much more important right now, uh, the cadavers lab, because we already have uh, conceived an idea that is working very well during the cadavers lab. And what we will do in the uh, ship trial is continuing this idea on the animals. But we are already trying to perform uh, this uh, idea directly on the human patient, in, who is a cadaver. 
Um, so I think it's much more important right now uh, because it, we, basically we are going to um, to go to go to go up uh, with the with the with the surgical technique to put the cylinder in uh, in um, vertical direction basically so to go up. If uh, I have uh, understood your question, if and and if I have um, I don't know if I have uh, answered correctly. Yes. So once animal trials are done, am I wrong in saying you guys will pretty much know that it works? You just have to do the human trial. It's just a bureaucratic thing. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. That's awesome to hear. All right. Thank you. Hey, so how is the limb system testing going? Has that started yet? And what is that looking like? So the limbs testing is, um, for anyone who, uh, limbs is laboratory information management system. The limb system is a laboratory management system for the information so that we can have like patient information and then we can have uh, like a donor sample information and then that could help the surgeon uh, match up a prospective donor with a patient. And then when you go in for a consultation, they could, you know, have all the information for a donor sample ready. They could kind of consult with you on, you know, how many steps the procedure will be, care, stuff like that after the procedure. And uh, we can use that system for follow up as well. So we can like communicate with you remotely, say like, hey, do you have any issues? And that information can be logged in the system. Uh, so we we looked at a few different um, organizations and we decided on on one uh, limb system. Uh, I reviewed it with uh, one of our or a few of our board members, and then the next phase of that is to introduce that to the on the animal trial and the. Uh, the limb system will be used for the animal trial. So the the point of doing that is to make sure that, like, imagine if the animals are a final patient and we have an ECM that's assigned uh, in the system, we can use the system effectively to pair up the correct ECM with the correct patient. In this case, animals, so it's not really an exact uh, match on that, but it, it's going to give us an idea if it can work the way we need it to. Uh, so that, that's kind of the timeline for that and a little bit of an explanation of what the limb system is. Yeah. And I just wanted to add on to that because, um, I included that in the newsletter a couple months back and William and I had talked about, um, soliciting volunteers to provide mock data for us to play with in the limbs, uh, system to test with. And so, uh, thank you to all of you who responded to, um, that call on newsletter. We've gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of, uh, emails of interest, and I've been trying to reply to all of them. So for those who did email us, um, I have your information. And as William and I determined that volunteers are needed to provide mock data, uh, we will reach out to you. Um, so again, thanks. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. To answer that question, I'm sorry. And yeah, I was, I thought like from a whole no perspective, <laughs> um, no, um, like when we would need the donor, uh, uh, faux information to, to play with the system. Probably, um, I would say probably early next month. That way we know the system is going to be ready for animal trial and we can start populating it with uh, like semi-randomized uh, faux data so that we could actually like vet it out while it's in use for another an active system. So yeah, I'm sorry. That was a great question. <laughs> I realized that's where it was aimed. All right. Thank you. Um, I, think, I believe we have a couple more questions queued up. Hey there. I'll try to be fast. I really appreciate all of your time. One thing I've heard a lot, especially in the last year, is that the focus right now is on the clinical trials and getting those out, you know, successful and all of that. I guess to ask about, like, plans of plans. Is creating a public procedure after that something you are even going think about before those are concluded? Or is that just the main focus now until those are done and finished? And then maybe you even working with partners or doing it yourself, like making the procedure public after that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understood the question. Is uh, essentially like, how are we going? Do we plan on making it public or keeping it private after the completion of the human clinical trial? And how do we how do we plan on doing that? And I, we definitely do have uh, some conversations around that. Um, I'll I'll turn that one over to Enzo, uh, if that's okay, Enzo. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, we have thought to this obviously and. Um... You know, we would like to do some private uh, surgery after the trial, and of course, uh, the only thing, obviously, uh, we have to wait at least one year 
after the trial because we want to be sure that every update on the patient uh, is done correctly and we don't know and we know exactly that there are no infections or you know or collateral effects that, that's the way I would do, feel uh, to answer to your question but we have definitely uh, thought to a possible procedure with the obviously with the um, amount of uh, organs uh, we can count at the, at the specific uh, time because you have to consider also this problem. To, to add on to that too, is like right now we have the one active surgeon. So we're bringing on more uh, talent in that regard. So we, we've definitely talked about it, but we, we're not 100% sure how we're going to implement that to answer your question. Um, it It's still in the works. Uh, we've actually talked with a couple, um, uh, a couple board meetings just on this topic. So... It's definitely something we're considering, um, and uh, I'm sure Brian will have updates as we as we get to the human clinical trials, and that becomes a priority that we talk about. Um, yeah, so I, I could definitely say like when we say like our goals are human clinical trials, like we, we definitely want to get through the human clinical trial, but we are thinking about like immediately after. Uh, how is it going to be public? Do we you know do we have to partner with a hospital? Do we have to partner with a surgical ward? Like how is that going to work? And we we don't. Um, we don't exactly know that answer uh, to make it public uh, quite yet. Obviously, uh, we've talked about like taking care of the donors for the four gen group. Um, like that would be more of a private, uh, uh, just within the four gen group. Um, so I think that's been thought about a little bit more than the public aspect of it. Uh, Ryan or Enzo, if there are any any more to add on? No, I think that, uh, you know, just, uh, I just, I want to thank you because, and I want to thank all of you because without uh, your donations, we, we, we wouldn't be where we are. But the reality is that, uh, uh, you know, we understand also because we understand also the pressure and the expectations that you have, uh, which we consider this. But, uh, you know, the reality is that we are really, really focused on... Uh, on the on the human trial right now so that's because we have uh, we are um, squeezing our brain to find the best uh, uh, you know option for the surgery the best innovation the best doctors the best idea the best creativity uh, the best team because uh, we we want to add more people and as I said even if we are fine right now it's just because we care we care of you for you and um, we want to do it perfect yeah that pretty much summed it up um, I think we have time for maybe one more question and by the way um, thank you to everyone who's been contributing to our GoFundMe fundraiser. It's approaching 16000 now, which is awesome. And that's going to, those funds are going to go a long way in helping make sure that we are, um, you know, more than, more than okay financially as we prepare for the human clinical trials. Again, thanks a lot um, for your support there. I have a question. I was wondering to what extent will qualitative outcomes be tested in the clinical trials? like in terms of sensations or general experience, like how it actually heals as opposed to just, is the thing innervated or not, falling off? How will you measure the regenerated sensation? I, I would like to think about this. This is something for uh, who has been circumcised as uh, when uh, he was just born. It should be something, uh, a nice pleasure for the first time of his life. So I, I see things in a, in a romantic way because for people who underwent to the surgery as adults, they already know what they expect. Maybe they can tell us better than, uh, than the others if uh, it's uh, what they were expecting in terms of regeneration. I think that if we do things correctly, I'm pretty optimistic that regeneration will occur and it will be successful. Not of regeneration, I say. So is that something that is being measured or targeted in the trials? Or, I don't know, is it a next step kind of thing? Enzo's brought this up a few times, that he's actually 
talked about setting up a, like a side test in the trial because this is essentially the first time this has ever been done. And it would be essentially exactly what you, you asked, like having uh, a quantitative um, or qualitative uh, test uh, set up for people that go in uh, before the procedure, uh, give their feedback, and then after the procedure, give their feedback at different points. And and we've talked about this. We, we haven't come to a solid decision if it's something we're going to include. I, I think it's a good idea to include a, a research like this. Um, especially after like to, after the procedure to show like validation that you know it's it's a meaningful procedure uh but um yeah and i <laughs> enzo's on the same wavelength he's brought this up a, f uh, a few times about like the sensation uh and measuring the sensation because there have been a few research uh papers out there that were um a little bit lackluster in how they measured sensation and uh how they measured what they measured and why so um, it, that is a really excellent question and it is something we've discussed, but I don't think we've, Enzo, do you, do you have any more on that? Like, did you, did you have, well, idea I think, uh, the question, uh, the question is great. Also, as you know, that I'm very, uh, you know, well, what I really want in this, um, mission, I want to achieve regeneration. So the would, uh, the best way to answer to your question is that we should measure, uh, before and after the, the surgery to each guy that undergo to, to the surgery. So, so do some tests in some way, but we haven't thought exactly how to do, you know, precisely. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. No, I appreciate that question. Um, all your questions. Uh, thank you guys. It's been really nice to t uh, speak with the supporters and, and I know a lot of you guys, uh, message, uh, fairly routinely in the discord and chat about this stuff, but it's, it's really good to have these conversations. Thank you guys again. Yeah, I echo that 100%. Thank thank you all to everyone here um, for giving us your support, um, every, you know, all the time and, and you know, staying uh, focused on our mission and everything. And I'm excited for the next uh, couple of months. I'm excited to see the results of the sheep trials at Cadaver Labs. I know you all are too. And so we'll continue to keep you keep you updated on that as well. Enzo, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, depart this time? No, I just want to thank you. I feel very close to each one of you guys. Really, thank you very much for your support. Yeah, on that note, thank, thank you all again. And um, we'll end it now. Take care, and we'll see you in the next call. And if you have any more questions, just go ahead and reach out to to me or, um, or William in the chat, and uh, we'll go from there. Take care, everyone. Thanks again, guys. Oh, ciao a tutti. Thank you.